All right, time for us to do some more practice with problems which involve understanding increase and decreasing as well as classifying critical points using the first derivative. As always, it's really important for you to do as much as you can. So make sure you try to do these problems by yourself first before watching the video. Or if you are watching the video and following along, make frequent use of that pause button and try to go out as far as you can on your own first. And then you can follow along and see what I do. And you're like, oh, he might be onto something. I know what to do next. The more that you do, the better you're going to be. So keep doing as much as you can. All right, well, let's begin. Our first problem, find and classify all critical points for the function g of x, which is 3x squared minus 2x cubed plus 6e to the x times x squared minus 3x plus 3. Now this is kind of a nice function because it's a combination of polynomial and e to the x. These are both nice functions defined everywhere. No restriction on our, our domain. Since we're after critical points, well, we need to use the first derivative, which is good because we also use the first derivative to classify. So first step, find the derivative. All right, so g prime of x. What will that be? Well, 6x, nice, minus 6x squared good now here we we'll use a product rule derivative of the first term 6 e to the x there's a lot of sixes in this problem times the second and then we're going to add the first 6 e to the x times the derivative of the second which is 2x minus 3. all right so there we go now let's uh, see if we can't clean this up a little bit in particular, if I look on the last two terms, just these last two here, what we see is they both have e to the x involved. In fact, they both have 6 e to the x involved. So if we were to combine these together, what would we get? Well, we'd get 6 e to the x times, here's x squared, uh, then we have a minus 3x, a plus 2x, so that's minus x, and then a plus 3 minus 3 cancels. Wasn't well, that lovely? All right. Now I look here. I see x squared minus x. And here I see something that has an x and a minus x squared. And I say, ooh, if I were to take the, the first two terms here, and if I were to pull out, say, a minus 6. Now, the 6 is easy to see. Why the minus? Well, because I really want it to look like an x squared in front. So minus 6 times x squared, and then it'll be minus x, right? And then I say, hey, this is perfect. What do we have here? Well, we have the following. I can pull out a 6, and I can pull out an x squared minus x. And then we have a minus 1 from here and an e to the x from there. So that'll be a e to the x minus 1. Good. Done. Done. Well, no, not yet. We, we can do one more thing. What can we do with this x squared minus x? Well, we can pull out an x. So we get 6, then times x times x minus 1 times e to the x minus 1. All right. Now, next, we need to think about, well, what can you do? Well, hmm. Now we need to say, where are our critical points? So we're going to ask, where is this equal to 0? So set this equal to 0. And now we have a couple of candidates to talk about. We have our x. Well, that happens at x equals 0. Our x minus 1 that happens at x equals 1. And then here we have e to the x minus 1. Now. Can that ever be 0? And when? Well, it can be 0, and that happens at x equals 0. All right, good. Now, you might say, hey, 0 is there twice. Does that mean it's extra critical? Well, no, not so much that it's extra critical. But the fact that 0 shows up as multiple times might say 0 is maybe not as interesting as we might think when we first see the function. OK, so, or maybe it's more interesting. Who knows? It's all a matter of perspective. 
So we really have two critical points. We have one at zero, and we have another at one. All right, so what do we do? Now, to classify, we really need to understand what's happening on each one of these three pieces. Are we going up or are we going down? So we need to use our first derivative to figure out things such as, are we increasing or are we decreasing? So, hmm, let's uh, figure that out. So we plug, plug in various values. What's something below zero? Well, negative one. Okay, or we can pick like negative 100, doesn't really matter, large negative. Okay, so we can see the six we don't need to ever worry about. That'll be a negative, that'll be a negative, and now we have to think about this. If I have e to a large negative number, it's actually pretty small. Then I subtract one, we'll make it negative. So negative, negative, negative means what? Well, it means that our derivative is negative below zero. All right, how about from zero to one? Let's say a half. Okay, well, let's see. We're gonna have positive and negative, a half minus one, and then e to the x minus one. Well, e to the half minus one. Is that positive or negative? Now, if you're not so sure, one of the things you can think about is think about what does the function e to the x minus 1 look like. See, e to the x looks like this. It goes up. Now, what does e to the x minus 1 do? Well, the minus 1 really is a shift down. So it's like you took this function and you just translated it down by 1. That's what the minus 1 does. So it would look like this. And it crosses here at x equals 0. So at a half, e to the x minus 1 is going to be positive because we're over on this portion of it there. All right, so where are we? We're positive, negative, positive, which means we're still negative. If we pick a number bigger than 1, say 2, positive, positive, and very positive. You know, we're coming up over to this part. And everything's positive. Ah, the most optimistic part of the function. And so now we say, okay, what's happening? Well, we're going down and down, right? Negative, negative. Here we're going down and then up, negative, positive. So our critical points are at zero and one. And what can we say? Well, we can say x equals zero is neither max or min. It kind of just sort of plateaus. On the other hand, x equals 1 is a local min. And that's our answer. Now we can actually do a little bit better than that. Not only can we say that x equals 1 is a local min, it's stronger. It turns out that x equals 1, we can say, is an absolute min. Now, you might say, whoa, Steve, wait. When we've talked about absolute max and min, we've always talked about it for closed bounded intervals. And this is definitely not a closed bounded interval. This is all numbers. How do we know it's an absolute min? Well, the answer is, what happens as you move away from one? As you move to the right, we're going up. So as we move to the right, we're heading off in a positive way, we're increasing. Now, think about what happens before one. See, we're decreasing before one. So if we head in the opposite direction, move from one down, then we're gonna be going up as we move in the backwards direction. So from both directions from one, we're heading up. And it doesn't matter how far off we are, we're always moving up, 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 and away. Therefore, the smallest value we can ever achieve will happen at one. All right, good. That's a little fun side note. A little extra bonus, if you will. All right, well, that's uh, our first problem. On to our next problem. So, suppose our function is x squared e to the negative 3x divided by x squared minus 3. Determine where the, where, sorry, excuse me, determine the intervals where the function is increasing and where it is decreasing and classify any critical points. 
Now we've got to be a little bit careful here because this is a little bit different than some of the functions we normally talk about. Notice something about our denominator. x squared minus 3. That can be 0. So if we pause for a second before we start jumping in, our function here, uh, I'll write down again, x squared e to the minus 3x divided by x squared minus 3. This is uh, undefined at x equals plus or minus the square root of 3. So in some sense, those are critical because the function is undefined there. Therefore, the derivative has to be undefined there. So, uh, But that would naturally come out as we go through and, and, and take our, our derivative here. It has to be the case if your derivative, if your function is undefined, the derivative will automatically be undefined as well because you can't even take the derivative because it fails to satisfy the definition of what the derivative will do. So, all right, time for us to do some more practice with that quotient rule. Okay, uh, we're going to get kind of good at that. And that's not our intention to be great at the quotient rule. But, you know, it is what it is. So, taking our derivative, we're going to take the bottom, x squared minus 3, times root of the top. So for that, we're going to need to do the product rule. So the product rule says take the root of the first, 2x, times the second, plus the first, times the root of the second. Well, e to anything, you're, the root of that is e to that anything, times the root of that anything. So in other words, the root of the exponent. In our case, it would be negative 3, minus, okay, so we took the bottom times the root of the top, so minus the top, x squared e to the minus 3x, times root of the bottom, which would be 2x. All of that. Divide that by x squared minus 3 squared. This is why I said you'll still run into the same problem with being undefined at plus or minus root 3. Because you still have that same issue, where, you, where if you plug in positive root 3 or negative root 3, you're still going to get 0 downstairs. Now, Let's think about what we can do to clean things up. Now, there are a couple of things which we can spot really quick. First off, as we look at the upstairs, we see that e to the minus 3x is attached to every single term. So, since it's attached to every single term, let's factor it out. We'll pull it all the way out. Okay. So, and then we'll be very careful with what remains. So, we have an e to the minus 3x. Now, here we have x squared minus 3 times 2x minus 3x squared. All right, so time for foiling. Let's be careful. x squared times 2x is 2x cubed. x squared times minus 3x squared is minus 3x to the fourth. Minus 3 times 2x minus 6x minus 3 times minus 3x squared is a plus 9x squared. And then, don't forget the last term, that'll be a minus 2x cubed. All right? Ooh, interesting. All that divided by x squared minus 3 squared. Now, we have a little bit of good news. There's a little bit of simplifying that happens upstairs that you can spot. See that 2x cubed and the minus 2x cubed cancel. It's probably a sign that we're on the right track. You know, when you see when things get simpler, it's like, hey, we're probably doing something right. Ah, I love it when we get to do stuff that's right. Okay, now, what else? Well, hmm, it looks a little, a little intimidating here because that's a, a fourth degree polynomial. Ugh. Hmm, well, we, uh, we forge ahead, right? So, well, let's clean it up. First off, there is a little bit of something that we can do. There's an x we can pull out, and we can pull out a 3. I'm going to pull out a negative 3 because I want the linear coefficient to be positive. So, what do we have? We have e to the minus 3x, and then we're going to pull out a minus 3 times x, and what's left? We're going to have x cubed, then minus 3x, and plus 2. All that divided by x squared minus 3 squared. All right. Well, 
Now, what comes next? Hmm, well, this should be interesting. We gotta tackle a cubic. I don't know if we've done that. Well, but how do we do that? One of the things you can do is, is the method of guessing. All right, maybe it has a nice root. Okay, well, what are some nice numbers to guess? Uh, one. One's a nice number. Now, by the way, there's something called the rational root test. And if you remember the rational root test says, suppose you have all, all whole numbers, then you take anything that can divide into two, divide anything that divides into one, and those are your possible rational roots. So it really means the only possible rational choices we have are plus or minus one and plus or minus two. Well, let's try one of those. How about one? Does one work? One minus three plus one works. <laughs> oh, they gave us something we can make progress on. Woohoo! Okay, now suppose we knew that one worked. What could we do? Well, we could try other values. Uh, how about two? Does two work? That'd be eight uh, minus six plus two. No, it doesn't work. Uh, now that doesn't mean we give up. Maybe negative two works. Negative eight plus six, negative two does work. Whoa, nice. Um, so you can keep trying roots or you can do factoring. Uh, how do we factor? Well, suppose now we know x equals one is a root. So we, we've gone to the following stage. We can say that this is, uh, I'll clean up the upstairs. So minus three e to the minus three x times x, and then because one is a root, that says a factor here is x minus one, we still have the x squared minus three squared. Now, the x over x, sorry, the x times x minus one. So what we can do is, uh, we'll come over here and just do it on the side here. Do some long division. Ah, oh, it's been so long since we've done long division. It's been too long. So, uh, x cubed plus 0x squared minus 3x plus 2, and I'm going to divide x minus 1. Now, the process of long division is really simple. You always ask, let me look at the lean terms and say, what if I just had that? So here's x. I want to get to x cubed. What would I have to multiply it by to get from x to x cubed? The answer is x squared. Okay, so now I multiply x squared times that whole expression. That's x cubed minus x squared. Do a little bit of subtraction, and we'll end up with x squared minus 3x plus 2. Now again, ask the same question. Here's x squared, here's x. What do I have to multiply x by to get to x squared? I have to multiply by, by x, so that's a plus x. So then I multiply x times this whole thing, x squared minus x, subtract. The x squared cancel. Of course they do, because we chose them to do that. And we're going to end up minus 3x minus minus x is minus 2x plus 2. And I say, well, to get from x to minus 2x, I need a minus 2. So minus 2x plus 2. Aha! Uh -huh. We subtract, we get 0. No surprise, because we knew it was going to be 0, because we knew 1 was a root. So that says this would be, I'll come over here, x squared plus x minus 2. And now we're like, all right, good. We're back to quadratics. We're back to something we feel comfortable with. And uh, can we factor? I think we can. Minus three, e to the minus three x, x, x minus one. So what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for things which have the following. Two numbers that multiply to get negative two, add to give positive one. And I think two numbers that do that are x plus two, and x minus 1. We can check x squared, good, then minus x plus 2x, and then minus 2. All right, all right, good. Now, where are our critical points? Okay, so our critical points would be uh, at, so let's make our, our list here of our critical points. And uh, you can say, well, 
zero, that's a critical point. One is a critical point. In fact, it shows up twice. Hmm. At negative two. And you might get into a debate whether or not to include square root of three and minus square root of three. In my mind, I wouldn't include them. And here's the reasoning. Because they're really not part of our function. It's where our function is undefined. And so since our function is undefined, then it, we can't really have it be a critical point of our function. When we're talking about critical points, we're talking about which points that you can plug into the function are important. So I can't talk about it, it being a max or a min or neither because I can't even plug it in. So it's, it's sort of an obstacle to overcome. All right, so, so we really have our three critical points, 0, 1, and negative 2. Now, keep in mind, e to the negative 3 x can never be 0. So that's a good thing to know. We may want to do one more thing here just to help us see what's going on with the numerator is say, hey, this is minus 3, e to the minus 3x, x minus 1 quantity squared times x times x plus 2, and divide that by x squared minus 3 quantity squared. Now, I want to draw your attention because our next step here is to figure out positive or negative. Look at all of this. This e to the minus 3x, the x minus 1 quantity squared, the x squared minus 3 quantity squared. What can we say about that part, just that part? What's true? Well, can it ever be negative? No, it can't. See, this part right here is always going to be positive because you either square things or it's the exponential function. All these things are going to be greater than or equal to 0. So yeah, well, I should put it greater than or equal to 0. OK, so now we're ready to talk about our intervals. So we do have the critical points, but we also need to keep track of the plus and minus root 3. So it's important to know where root 3 falls. It's between 1 and 2. So our critical points are at negative 2. Then we also need to pay attention to weapons at negative root 3. At 0. At 1. And at positive root 3. And so there's the places for us to understand our function. In other words, between these points, our functions will have either a consistent increasing or decreasing behavior. So now we go into it. So let's go into it piece by piece. Suppose we start below negative 2. Well, what happens? We see this part, the part that's always greater than or equal to 0, it's not going to help us figure out the sign. So we don't have to worry about any of that. This part will always be negative. Then we'll have a negative 2. That's negative. And then, uh, sorry, pick up like a number like negative 3. So negative, negative, and then that'll be negative. So three negatives means that my sign for my derivative, I'll just put as a minus. So this is the, the sign of derivative, the f prime. So negative. Now, as soon as I pass negative 2, what happens? As I pass by negative 2, what happens to the value of x plus 2? Below negative 2, so if I'm just below negative 2, I'm negative. If I'm just above negative 2, I'm positive. So what will happen is I'll be a negative, still negative, but now that's positive. So I can now say I'm positive. OK, now we skip over negative root 3 and ask what happens between negative root 3 and 0. Well, hmm, what does happen? Well, let's see. We would have, uh, say, negative 1. That would work. OK, negative, negative, positive, which means we're still positive. Between 0 and 1, well, a half, negative, positive, positive. So we're negative. Between 1 and root 3, OK, say like, you know, just a little bit bigger than 1. Because root 3 is like 1.7 and 1.01 or something. 
negative, positive, positive. Okay, so still negative. And something bigger than root three, you know, like 100, negative, positive, positive. So negative, positive, positive means we're still negative. All right, well, that's a really very negative part of the function there. But, well, you know, it is what it is, right? Okay, so what do we conclude? Where are we increasing? So we're increasing in the following intervals. Negative 2 up to negative root 3. We don't include negative root 3 here because our function is not defined. And from negative root 3 up to 0. So it's true that on both these intervals, we're increasing both, but we're not going to say we're increasing from negative 2 up to 0. What's actually happening here, if you were to sketch this function, is you'd have an asymptote coming up from negative root 3, and, you know, uh, this way, and then another asymptote coming from down below. So it's whoosh, and then whoosh. Well, okay, so that's, we can't, we can't merge these together. And that's it. Okay, so where are we decreasing? Well, we're decreasing from minus infinity up to minus 2. Okay, and then from 0 all the way up to root 3. Now here we can merge these intervals together because 1, that's a repeated root. And so, it, but it's defined. See, that what's really happening is that the fact that it's negative 1 squared. And so anyways, but because our function is defined and we're decreasing, decreasing, these do go together. That is a parenthesis, just to be clear. And then, of course, from square root of 3 off to infinity. Okay, so that's the answer to where we increasing, decreasing. Now, our critical point at 0, what do we see? Well, at 0, we see we're going to go up and then down. And therefore, 0 is a local max. At 1, we're going down and then down again. So this is neither max or min. And at negative 2, we're going down then up. So this is a local min. And there you go. So we actually know a lot about our function. We can see that negative 2 is an interesting point. So somehow our function is coming down, then it's going back up, then it's going to have, hit an asymptote, and then after that it's going to come off the asymptote to zero, then it's going to go back down again, probably a little bit of a bit of zzz, zzz, off towards another asymptote, and then we're going to finally, after root three, come off another asymptote. So uh, you can try it, plug it into a, a, a any graphing calculator. You can even do a Google search. If you do a Google search, you know, y equals this function, it'll plot it for you. You can see it, and you'll see. All right, yeah, it has the behaviors here. All right, well, whew, that was a good one. On to the next problem. Okay. Given that for a particular value of b, the function f of x, which is e to the bx over x squared plus 4, has a critical point at x equals 1. They didn't even give us the function, right? Because they don't tell us what b is. Ah, all right. Well, we have to determine the value of b, the intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing, and classify all critical points of f of x. Okay. So, hmm. Well, we know we're after critical points. There's no endpoints. Uh, this is actually kind of a nice function. It involves exponential. There is an x squared plus 4 downstairs, but that's never negative, uh, and it's never zero. It's always positive. So, so this is really a nice function everywhere. Well, let's uh, get into it. Now, critical point gives us something about the derivative, and so a critical point is either the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined. Let's take a look at it and see what the derivative looks like, and then we'll figure out which one it could be. So, more quotient rule. Yeah, lots of that. Okay. So we're going to take the bottom, x squared plus 4, times through the top, b e to the b x, minus the top, e to the b x, times through the bottom, which is 2x. All of that, divide that by the bottom term 
squared. Well, all these pieces are nice, and so the derivative will never be undefined. So we say, okay, that gives us something. In particular, this part here, the fact that there's a critical point of x equals 1, that's really telling us that if we plug 1 into our derivative, we better get 0 out. All right, so that's information we can use to our advantage. So let's actually carry out that computation. So we know that f prime of 1 would be what? Well, 1 plus 4, that's 5 times b, then e to the b times 1, that's e to the b, then minus e to the b times 2, so minus 2e to the b, divide that by 1 squared plus 4, that's 5 squared. I can write that as 25. Now we could write that if we clean it up, the e to the b can come out, the over 25, we'll just leave there, and we have 5 times b minus 2. But we know f prime of 1 is 0. So this has to be 0. But of course, the e to the b isn't 0, the over 25 isn't 0, so it has to be the 5b minus 2 causing us our 0. So that lets us say, hey, b has to be 2 over 5. Right? You know, add 2, divide by 5. Aha! We did it! We've, we did the first thing. Determine the value of b. Check. b has to be 2 over 5. Now, the next part is increasing, decreasing. So let's go back to our derivative. And so we're going to come back up here. But now we know what b is. So everywhere where we see a, a b, we're going to put in 2 fifths. So this would be x squared plus 4 times 2 fifths e to the b times x, so that's, I'll say 2x over 5, that's really 2 fifths times x, minus, again, e to the b times x, e to the 2x over 5, and 2x. All of that, divide that by x squared plus 4, quantity squared. Well, Let's pull out the common. They have, both have e to the 2x over 5. I also want to get rid of the fraction. Um, so I'll pull out a 1 fifth, and I'll pull out a 2, because there, there's a 2 as well. So 2 fifths e to the 2x over 5. Now, what's left? From the first term, we actually grabbed all of the, the, the sort of the end part. So there's an x squared plus 4. So x squared plus 4. Now you might say, oh, Steve, you left a pretty big gap there. I did leave a pretty good, big gap there, because I'm spotting this as going to be something x, so I might as well slip it in, just make it nice and comfortable. So what do I have? I grab the e to the 2x over 5, I grab the 2, you might say, but there's no over 5 part here. So what we have to do is we have to have something there to compensate. So it's going to become a minus 5x, and that will make it so that work backwards, right? If you now distribute this in, you see that those fives cancel, so you just be left with the 2, the 2x. All right. And of course, there's still the denominator, but in some sense, that's less important to us. What really we're after is understanding the critical points. We know there's no place where it's undefined, so we're after the zeros. That's going to come from the x squared minus 5x plus 4. We already know one of the roots. It was told to us at the very beginning. Do you, do you remember? one. One has to be a root, because when we plugged in one into our derivative, we got zero out. And you can check. You get one minus five plus four is zero. All right, so that tells us that this will factor, and one of the factors has to look like x minus one. Well, once you know one of the factors, you can get the other for almost free. So x times what gives x squared? Well, x Minus 1 times what gives plus 4? Minus 4. Divide that by x squared plus 4 quantity squared. And now we're like, aha, we see what's going on. Where are our zeros coming from? We had one we already knew about at 1, and now we have a second zero at 4. So our critical points 
are at x equals 1 and 4. Okay, time for us to draw our line. So we're going to draw our number line. Shoop. And we mark our two points. Our points are 1 and 4. So here's 1. Here's 4. And now we need to evaluate at various points in our interval. So something below 1. 0. That's a great number, below 1. And if you look, you really just need to focus on the, you know, this part right here, the x minus 1 times x minus 4. That will be the part that determines our sign, because the rest of it is always going to be positive. So if I plug in 0, minus 1, minus 4, multiply them together, I see that, aha, f prime positive. Well, let's plug in 2. 2 minus 1, 2 minus 4, positive, negative. So the result is a negative derivative between 1 and 4. If I plug in something bigger than 4, like 10, 10 minus 1, 10 minus 4, positive, positive. So we're positive here. Great. So we see we're positive, negative, positive, which means what? Well, we can say our function is going up, then down, and back up again. So we have that x equals 1 is a local max x equals 4 is a local min. And the other thing we can do now is talk about increasing, decreasing. Where do we increase? Well, we increase from negative infinity up to 1 and from 4 up to infinity. Where do we decrease? Well, from 1 up to 4. And there we go. That's that. And we answered all the questions, right? We found the value of b. We figured out the intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing. And we've classified the critical points. And that's all we needed to do. All right, good. Whew. Cool. This is kind of a fun problem. It's almost like a puzzle. You know, we have to solve one puzzle before we could, you know, first, what was b before we could solve the rest? Ah, I hope they're all this fun. All right, good. All right, on to our next problem. Determine when the function f of x, which is e to the negative 4x times x to the 4 fifths plus x to the 9 fifths is increasing and when it is decreasing. All right, so we kind of hopefully know our, our you know, routine by now. We're going to find our critical points, split our, our interval up, and uh, go from there. Okay, now... We might say, hey, these are kind of weird exponents, right? Four-fifths and nine-fifths. Do we need to worry about it being undefined? Well, the good news is whenever you have x to a power, as long as it's a positive power, and if it's a fraction, and the denominator is odd, then you're great. It'll always work. If your denominator is even, so it's like to a half or three halves, you have to be a positive value. Or if you have x to a weird number, like x to the e, then x has to be positive. But but yes, x to 4 fifths, x to 9 fifths, you can plug in any number you want, you'll get something out that makes sense. All right, so, well, we start by taking our derivative. So, product rule, since we have the product of two functions. So we're going to take the derivative of the first, minus 4, e to the minus 4x, times the second, x to 4 fifths plus x to 9 fifths. Then we're going to add to that the first function, e to the minus 4x, times the derivative of the second, which is 4 fifths x to the minus 1 fifths, right? Because we bring the 4 fifths down, subtract 1 from 4 fifths, that would give us negative 1 fifths, then plus 9 fifths x to the 4 fifths. Because 9 fifths, if you subtract 1, you're really subtracting 5 fifths. So you end up with 4 fifths. Okay, so there's certainly some things we can do. Let's uh, pull out the e to the negative 4x, because that's common to everything. And, uh, well, we'll get there and then, hmm, let's also pull out a fifth, just so we get rid of our fractions for the time being. Okay, so I'm going to pull out a 1 fifth e to the negative 4x. Now, from the first term, Notice there's no fifths, 
So there's really like, I have to multiply this by five to compensate. So this is now minus 20. And if you distribute that through, that's minus 20. X to the four fifths, and then minus 20. And that looks like a really terrible, but that is a nine. X to the nine fifths. And then here, we pull out the fifths, so we pull out the negative four X, so we have a plus four X to the minus one fifth. And here, a plus nine X to the four fifths. And uh, well, hey, some good news. You see, we have two X to the four fifths. So those can be combined. And we say, all right, well, what happens when we combine them? So let's see, we get uh, one fifth E to the minus four X. And uh, let's rearrange things. So highest power is nine fifths. So minus 20 X to the nine fifths. And then there's minus 20 plus nine, which makes minus 11 X to the four fifths. And then plus four X to the minus one fifth. Now, what can we do? Well, not much in common between 20, 11, and four. I'm gonna go ahead and pull out a negative because I always like my coefficient front to be positive. The other thing is, these are weird powers of X, but they're all powers of X. So let's figure out the smallest power of X, and then we'll pull that out front. So between our choices, we have nine fifths, four fifths, and minus one fifth. Well, minus one fifth is the smallest, so we're gonna pull out X to minus one fifth. So we now have minus one fifth, x to the minus one-fifth, e to the minus four x. All right, so what are we left with? All right, so it's like, if we're putting out minus one-fifth, it's like we add a fifth to each of these exponents. So 10 fifths will leave us with a x squared. We pull out a negative, so that's why it's now positive. Then plus 11 x, again, pull out a negative, so that switches to sign. Four fifths plus one is just one and minus four. Okay, good. All right, are we done? Well, we'd like to go a little bit further. Now we can start to spot certain things. Um, certainly the e to the minus four x, we're not gonna worry about that. We know it's nice. The fact that we see an x to the minus one fifth tells us zero is gonna be an issue with this derivative because if you plug in x equals zero, you have zero to a negative exponent, which means your function's blowing up. And so, we know that zero is gonna have uh, a place where our derivative is undefined. So that's gonna be a critical point. But now we gotta dig into that. And uh, hmm, this one's gonna be a little bit more interesting than we usually do, right? So we're, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for some way, ideally, that we can factor this. So, well, we should think about what are we trying to do. So, hmm, what could we do? Well, the fact that we see a minus here says that one of these things will be a, a minus, one of them will be a plus. All right, now what else can we say? Well, we need, uh, we need to sort of break down both ends, right? Four, it could be four or one, or it could be two and two. It could be one, four. Now 20, uh, so many options for 20. 20 and one, two and 10, four and five, five and four, uh, 10 and two, and so forth and so on. But all right, let's see if we can't find something that works. What needs to be the case? Well, we have to multiply things together and such that when we take their difference, we get to 11, right? So let's see, 80 subtract one, no, not even close, come on. Uh, how, about, how about, let's see, 40 subtract two, no. 20 subtract four, nope. Okay, how about, let's see. Eight subtract 10, no. Uh, four subtract 20, no, 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 no. Two subtract four, no, come on, forget it, forget it. All right, 16 subtract five. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Did we see that right? Hold on, hold on, I think we might have something. So wait, so let's check this out. Four, five, and the four, one. So if we did that, we'd have 16 and five, whose difference is 11. So if we put a four X, and then that would have to multiply by the four. So that would give us our 16 X. Then we need to have the five X and the one. 
So I think that's it. Well, we can always check, right? 20x squared, good. Plus 16x minus 5x is 11 and minus 4. Ah, oh, it all works out. Our plan has come together. <laughs> nice, nice. So we, uh, all right, we'll add in the rest of it up front. Negative 1 fifth, x to the minus 1 fifth, e to the minus 4x. Okay, so there's our derivative. All right, we found it. But not only did we find it, we really cleaned it up. And when I say we cleaned it up, we made it nice and factored. See, factoring is very useful for us because what we want to do is we want to get to the point where we can identify uh, zeros and critical points and where we can easily tell sign. And that's the nice thing about factoring because when you have a bunch of stuff multiplying together, instead of having to do like one massive thing, we say, well, okay, what's happening with each little piece? And then we count how many times we have a positive, how many times we have a negative, and then we can figure out what goes on with the sign. So, well, we've done the hard part. And we worked. So hopefully the rest of it, we can relax and say, like, oh, this is good stuff. So what's the next step? Well, next step is identify our critical points. So certainly zero is a critical point. So all right, that will mark zero here. All right, 4x minus 1. When does that equal zero? Well, that's at a fourth. All right, so put something there. 5x plus 4. Well, that would be at negative 4 fifths. Put something there. Spacing is not really a concern. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like, oh, this if this is a fourth, then that would be 4, four fifths. No, no, no. We just need to get ordering. Ordering is the concern. Okay, so now we're pretty much ready to put it all together. The last thing is to say, look, we've split it up. We now have one, two, three, four pieces. We need to understand what happens on each piece. And we can actually do a little bit better because we can say, you know, we do know that we're going to flip sign at x equals 0, right? Because this is x to the fifth downstairs. If we plug in a negative, it's negative. If we plug in a positive, it's positive. And we know we're going to actually plug in signs at 4x minus 1 and 5x plus 4 because these are what we would call simple roots. In other words, they only show up once in our factorization. If they had shown up twice, it would be a double root. So if you have a double root, what happens is you sort of bounce off. You don't cross through. In your, think of x squared. All right, let me back up a little bit. If you think of x squared, what do you think of? Well, x squared, it comes down and then it comes back. So even though 0 is a root, you bounce off. But if you look at, say, x cubed, it does something like this, where it crosses. If you look at x to the fourth, it kind of looks like x squared is somehow stretched a little bit. Again, it bounces. Sometimes the number of times something shows up as a root is an indicator of whether you're going to cross or whether you're going to reflect. So I actually can spot that we're always going to change signs at each one of these points. So if I knew the sign at any interval, I'd be done. Uh, it's good to check always, just to be consistent. But All right, so let's start with, say, an easy number to, to do it. Let's say I picked 1. So I'll have a negative. 1 to something is positive. e to something is always positive. Here I'll have 4 minus 1, 3, positive. 5 plus 4, positive. So the only negative is up there. So there's one negative, which tells us that the whole thing is negative. So we have... Our derivative is negative. So it's going to be going down after a fourth. Now, between 0 and a fourth, well, you could pick something like an eighth. You know, if you're looking for a number in between, take the average. You know, if you add the two together and divide by 2, that gives you the halfway point. So a positive number, when I take it to the negative 1 fifth, is positive, always positive. This would be a half minus 1, which is negative. And here we'd have 5 halves plus 4, which is positive. So we have a negative and another negative, two negatives, which means, lo and behold, our derivative is now positive. So we're going up between 0 and a fourth. Between negative 4 fifths and 0, uh, you can do negative 2 fifths. We'll have a negative up from the front for that negative. A negative number to a, a 1 fifth 
is of negative value. So this is also negative. That's always positive. A negative subtract one is negative. If I take negative 2 fifths times 5, that's negative 2 plus 4 is positive. So I have 1, 2, and 3 negatives. So that says when I multiply them out, 3 negatives will give me a negative value. And if I plug in you know, like negative, negative 1, actually, that could, will work. Negative, negative, positive, negative, negative. There's four negatives. Multiply them together. It says, lo and behold, I end up with a positive thing. And like I said before, I know I'm going to flip the signs because these are all simple roots. Each one only shows up as a root once. So that can be helpful for me to figure out. If I can figure out the behavior somewhere, I can propagate the behavior if I know how many times a root occurs inside that derivative. Sometimes it's not so easy to see, so you, you plug in a point. Now, we're almost done. All that's left is for us to write down our answer. It's good to get to that stage of a problem. That's sort of like the best stage of a problem to be at, the writing the answer stage. So what do we have? Well, we can say that we are increasing where? Well, from negative infinity less than x, less than or equal to negative 4 fifths. And where else? And 0 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 1 fourth. I can include the endpoints because this is a continuous function. It's defined for all values of x, so we're fine. We are going to be decreasing, well, from negative 4 fifths to 0. So negative 4 fifths, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 0. And starting at 1 fourth and heading all the way up towards infinity. And that is the answer. Nice. Good. Beautiful. Beautiful. The fractions are a little bit messy to work with, but, you know, we've seen worse. All right. Well, one more. One more problem. And uh, I think we need to see a little bit more arc tangent. It's always good to get some more arc tangent in. So, find all critical points and classify them as local maximum, local minimum, or neither. And our function is 2 log of x squared plus 3x plus 6 minus 5 arctangent of x minus 2. Well, of course it is. <laughs> uh, in case you're wondering, what does that function look like? This is actually the function. That's it. That's what it looks like. And so, hmm, something seems to be happening over here. It's not quite so clear. And there seems to be something over there as well. Of course, that's if you had the function. What if you didn't have it? What if you only had this expression? Well, what would you do? Well, we do the procedure. We know the steps to get to our answer. So, we don't panic. We just enjoy the process. All right, what is the process? Start by taking a derivative. All right, so, f prime of x will be, so whenever you see a, a log, it's actually pretty nice to take derivatives of uh, logs. It's one over the inside. So in our case, x squared plus 3x plus 6. And then we're going to times it by the derivative of the inside, which is 2x plus 3. Minus, all right, for arctangent, 5. Uh, and we do 1 over 1 plus the inside term squared times the derivative of the inside. But in our case, uh, x minus 2 has a derivative of 1. So we're okay. All right, well, hmm, this is really 4x plus 6, divide that by x squared plus 3x plus 6, minus, and here we have 5, and if we square that, we'll get, uh, well, x squared, aha, look, it's, it's looking promising, and then uh, x minus 2 squared, the middle term would be minus 4x, Oh my, uh oh. This is not looking promising. And plus 4 plus 1 is plus 5. Well, what, would, what do we need to do? I, I should pause and say, should we be nervous about this function? In other words, is there any place where it's undefined? Now, you might say, uh, what can we say about x squared plus 3x plus 6? That might make us a little bit nervous. 
the, the denominator here, 1 plus x minus 2 squared, that's perfectly fine. It's always positive. Life is good. This part may make us say, ah, but I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm going to do a little side note here. If you're not sure, think about what we would do. x squared plus 3x, what would I need to add if I wanted this whole thing to be a square? I want this to be a square. Well, the rule is take the middle term, divide by 2, and square it. The so th 3 halves squared is 9 fourths. Well, I need to get up to 6. That gets me up to 9 fourths. Now, 6 is 24 fourths, which means I have a, quite a bit of space remaining, 15 fourths. So I really have x plus 3 halves squared plus 15 fourths, which means this expression is always positive. It's a square, which is a greater than equal to zero, plus something which is positive. Okay, so we know this is defined for all values, which means if I'm looking for critical points, I need to figure out where is my derivative equal to zero. Now, you might say, hey, let's just set things equal to zero and solve, but we also are going to have to go through and, and explore the function. So we're not just going to set this equal to zero and solve. We're going to clean this up which means brace yourself. There's a lot of algebra about to come our way. But you know what? It's good to do algebra. It's the people who are good at algebra enjoy calculus the most. And I hope we're enjoying calculus. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, we need to get a common denominator. And the way we're going to get a common denominator is we are going to multiply them together. So we're going to get and I'm moving it down here because I, I want to make sure I have plenty of space. So on the first term, I need to multiply top and bottom by this x squared minus 4x plus 5. So 4x plus 6 times x squared minus 4x plus 5. And on the second term, I need to multiply by x squared plus 3x plus 6 on top and bottom. So minus 5 times x squared plus 3x plus 6. All of that over this denominator. Okay, all right. So far, so good. Okay, now we expand. So what do we get? All right, now here, oh, it's, it feels like foiling, but it's not quite, right? Because here you have two terms, here you have three. So there's sort of like some extra layers going on. So where does foiling come from? The, the word foil, first, outer, inner, last, well, the idea is we're multiplying things together in all possible ways. And when it's two terms times two terms, there's four ways. Well, here, it's sort of like first, first, mid, you know, outer, you know, and then you have the inner, inner. You know, there's sort of like extra combination. But if you just remember what foiling does, it says pick something from the first thing and multiply it by something from the second thing in all possible ways, and then it works, you know. And that way you don't have to remember all these acronyms like, for a problem, right? Because, you know, you have all these different combinations. It's just always to multiply, pick something from here, pick something from there, multiply them together. So, 4x times x squared, 4x cubed. Ooh, we're going to have to deal with cubics. Interesting. All right, 4x times minus 4x, minus 16x squared. 4x times 5, 20x. 6 times x squared, 6x squared. 6 times minus 4x, minus 24x. 6 times 5 is 30. All right. Now, minus 5, don't forget that minus 5 distributes through to everything, not just to the first. So, minus 5x squared, minus 15x. Minus 30. All right. All of that divided by the denominator. Now, there's no real use to multiplying the denominator out because it, we're not going to get any information from the denominator. We know it's not 0, and we're looking for the critical points, which means we want the numerator to be 0. So let's just not do busy work that doesn't help us. We always want to do work that helps us. You know, that's our goal. Move forward. Get closer to a solution. Now, if we've been living a good, clean algebra life, nice things should start to happen right around here. In other words, we should start seeing things simplify. 
and I see something right away. The constants, plus 30, minus 30. <sighs> We've, we're on to something. We may have done it, done it correctly even. Okay, so let's uh, keep going. All right, so what do we have? Well, there's only a single x cubed. So 4x cubed. What else do we have? Uh, minus 16x squared. There's a plus 6x squared and a minus 5x squared. So if we put all those together, minus 16 plus 6 minus 5, that'll take us to minus 15x squared. Okay, maybe we should keep track of what we've grabbed. We grabbed the x cubed and we've now grabbed the x squared. All right, uh, which means we have the x's. So we have plus 20, minus 24, which gets us to negative 4, and then uh, minus 15, right? Wow, that's okay. That'll get us to minus 19x. All of that divided by x squared plus 3x plus 6 times x squared minus 4x plus 5. Oh, all right, now, good news. I can do a little bit of factoring up top pretty easily. And I think you see, right? They all have x. Ha ha ha, that's nice, good news. Okay, so x times 4x squared minus 15x minus 19. Okay, now at this stage you're like, oh, again? We're gonna have to factor? <sighs> yes, like I said, this class is fantastic at your algebra. If you survive this class, you're great at algebra. But in fact, we don't have to work too hard. Because I look at these coefficients, and at first, one thing that pops out is like, ah, oh, these numbers are really terrible, 4, 15, 19. But then I say, wait, whoa, whoa. 4, 15, 19, they kind of almost line up. And so when that happens, we say, maybe we should try some easy roots. What are some easy roots? Well, like one or minus one. See, if you plug in one or minus one into a polynomial, what you end up doing is you do combinations of the coefficients. So let's try a positive one. You'd have four minus 15 minus nine. Uh, that's not working. How about negative one? Plus four plus 15 minus 19. And that is zero. So negative one is a root. Now, you might say, well, that's great. How does that help us factor? Well, it's a tremendous help in factoring. Since negative one is a root, that means we know one of our factors. So we have our same denominator. And uh, wow, we are really patient to keep writing these over and over. But don't worry, we're almost there. We have our x. Since minus one is a root, x plus one has to be the factor because that would be what makes minus one a root. And now we say well, for the rest of it, we can just look at it and say, all right, I have to multiply x by something to get to 4x squared. Well, that's not so bad. It has to be 4x. And now I have to multiply one times something to get me to negative 19. Well, that would be negative 19. And now we're home free. We can see our, our roots popping up. What are they? So our critical points are the following. We have at zero, at negative one. We probably would have guessed zero. That's this point right here. Uh, negative one, it wasn't so clear. Is it really going down? Not so clear. But now we say, oh, there's something, there's something. We're, we're gonna figure out what it is. And then, uh, 19 fourths. Now, you would not have looked at this function and said, I think 19 fourths is critical to this function because it's not clear at all that it would have anything to do with this function. But it arose by doing the work. And that's why we have to. Okay, so we draw our line. So we have our, our points. We have negative one, zero, and 19 fourths. So I guess I should have marked where 19 fourths is. I would guess roughly there. All right. Just from the picture, we can probably tell what the answers are. So let's see if our computations agree with the picture. 
All right, so now we have to think about plugging in values. Now, the good news is that this part downstairs is always positive because of the way it's formed. We see we saw, said that x squared plus 3x plus 6 is always positive. And this 1 plus x minus 2 squared, which is the x squared minus 4x plus 5, is always positive. So when it comes to determining sine, I just need to see what happens upstairs. So I'll plug in like negative 2. Negative, negative, and then it's negative 8 minus 19, which is negative. So it's three negatives, meaning that this whole thing is negative below negative 1. So we are going down. All right, between negative 1 and 0, uh, pick like a half, negative a half. Negative, positive, negative. See, because it's a negative minus something. So two negatives, one positive, multiplied together, says positive. Between 0 and 19 fourths, pick like 1. 19 fourths is, uh, uh, you know, 4.75. So what do we have? We have positive, positive, negative. So therefore, negative. And if you pick it like 100, positive, positive, positive. All right. And there we go. So uh, we can now say, hey, we are doing what? We're going down, then we're going up, then we're going down, and then we're going up. So negative 1 is a min down up. 0 is a max up down and 19 fourths our really peculiar thing is another min we went down up all right and that's it that's that was our goal classify the critical points and find them all and we did it it took some work took some algebra but we did our work we did our algebra we got our answer keep working you're gonna get it it's going to become easier and easier the more you do. I believe in you. So keep coming, and we'll get there together.